All right, I wanted to go over uh, air boxes and carb carbs with you today. Uh, I'm going to start with the air boxes. That's probably uh, it's very complicated, and a lot of people do not realize how it works. So this is actually off a of CK3, and if you look at the um, air horn, ram tube, velocity stack, whatever you want to call it, um, this is only 28.3 millimeters, three of them. The stock, stock sled has three carbs, 38 millimeters. So your first thought is, how does it work? Well, if you come to this end, we're down to almost 40 millimeters, 39.9. So now I'm going to put her back in the air box. We'll show you the top. Again, a rounded air inducer. The screen's probably hurting you a little bit. We did take that out at the old Ford shootout. Interesting thing is, uh, to the average guy who doesn't have all the dyno resources, um, you would think to make more power we're going to eliminate this and eliminate the air box. So let's eliminate this first, but now if we look down here, we have velocity stacks again, which we dynoed with just the stacks and it's two horse matched to the stock uh, 38 car. So we're going to put our shelf back in because we know from dynoing when we set up our modified trail ported 192 horse uh, CK3 for the old Ford shootout we made two more horse and a lot more mid-range. The interesting thing um, the day of the race, and we were kind of new at it, we set the fastest CT and highest miles per hour. Rob Shooting from Hot to Go was pitted right next to me. Uh, he complained and whined about the driver, ended up driving his own sled the next pass. I asked his mechanic what he had done because I knew he said he changed the helix. I found out years later he had a customer's sled in the trailer that was a 1000 cc. They took his two sleds in the trailer, switched hoods, and Rob ran a 1,000cc hot to go against our 800CK3. We beat him by two miles an hour. I think he beat us by 100. The sad thing is he sold a lot of those big bores, which his 800 was probably 170 horse. Uh, so he sold customers all those kits thinking they were getting 190 like ours. We had 192. Um, ran very well and the Skidoo engineer came over to me and said why are you running the airbox in his broken French. I explained it to him and he grinned. He goes, yes, you are correct. Now, if we go racing, asphalt racing, you're saying why don't I use the airbox? Well, now we're up to a 56 millimeter car. We don't, it's too small basically. The other thing with the air box, for all you guys that want to buy pod filters, okay, you've lost your mid-range, you've lost horsepower, so you've lost two things. Now your third thing is the cold air comes in. Now when we dyno in the summer at 90 degree days like today, we're going to be down on a 200 horse motor or a 150 horse motor anywhere from 20 to 35 horsepower. So if you're out riding at 10 below zero, and you're drawing 50 degree air in because you got rid of your air box, you're going to be down 8 to 10 horse on an 800 twin. The second thing, so you're going to say, well, my buddy pulled his air box and his sled was a lot faster. Well, of course it was. Your buddy was jetted, five jets too rich. So when he pulled the air box, he effectively leaned his jetting down, but if he had left the air box on, jetted the sled correctly, he would have been way faster than he was without the air box. So, for these guys advertising aftermarket air boxes on these new twins, um, yeah, the new twins are one jet rich, two jets rich. You put the air box on, you'd be a hair quicker. If you take your stock motor, jet your carb, which is pretty easy, change one main jet and the bottom one size smaller, then you'll be way quicker with the air box, plus you'll have the mid range. Okay, so now let's go on to the next deal boring carbs. This is a uh, Rev. XP carb. So you wonder how we bored it. We showed in a demo yesterday, but what we didn't show is we have it clamped, we bore it, we unbolt it, so we're still true, and we bore through this end. Then we go in with a hand grinder, take a few thousandths off there by the nozzle, and we've got very good flow. 
I did explain, I think, a little on boring on why we do not taper bore, and this is why. If you look at the bell, nicely shaped bells, you'll also notice the ridge in there that I'm saying not to sand roll. That's to start the air. Just like on this carb on the Mach Z, that tube starts the air to get to your flare. And if you look at any of uh, crankshafts, electrons, real nice air uh, valve, rounded. Okay, a couple things I want to address on a stock car. Here's off a uh, XP where we're born at 42.2 or 42.3 for the trail. And of course, we give you the same thing we use, but, uh, but here's my carbs. But these are race carbs, so these are out to 42.95, darn near 43. A little bit of epoxy here to strengthen them. Um, and we can do the same for you if, if you have a race sled. The problem with the trail sled, if we go this big, the neck's gonna break off on you. But here's a neat thing that you can apply to your trail sled too, and I do on mine. Uh, Thundershift Products, Lon Peterson, has a dial -a jet so it hooks into the bottom of your float bowl, a tube in here, so approximately three-eighths to wide open at fixed fuel. So what I do since I'm running the race is have no real time to change a jet. I can reach in there with a screwdriver and within two seconds change my jet setting. Uh, very nice setup. Theoretically it gives you a little bit more power because you've got better atomization too. Um, and that's something we really see on the dyno. Uh, we do see a little better throttle response. Which brings another thing. Once you make your carb way bigger, then you create other issues. So the fact we've gone all the way from 40 to darn near 43, the bottom of our slide, we epoxied in so it's got less cutaway. What this did was richen up our bottom end for better throttle response. And this brings me one of my pet peeves. Anybody that's ridden a rev or a twin real hard knows that when you come up to a stop sign or let off that your idle hangs high. Perfectly normal. Take a 500 motocross and run it, motocrosser, run it real hard down a road at an enduro, and boy, you're going to be hanging at three grand. So the trick is just simply turn your idle down so when you start your sled cold, it won't idle. You have to keep your hand on the throttle. Do not listen to the guys on Do Talk to tell you to put bigger pilots in. Bigger pilots are like putting your choke on to bring your idle down. It's going to ruin your fuel mileage and ruin your horsepower. And before you put bigger pilots in, if these guys knew what they were talking about, you've got a big adjustment here. This is a fuel screw, which is usually in the three-quarter to one position. You can back it out another full turn, actually to about two and a quarter, and get a ton more fuel, which would be like one size bigger pilot. Now, if you were running at 30 below zero, then yes, maybe you would have to go one size bigger. So don't change your pilot, lower your idle, and play with your screw here. Now if it's 30 degrees in the spring you can turn it in a little. When it's zero in the winter you can turn it out a little. Okay, next thing I want to discuss with you is carb size. If you have a big bore, an 860 or an 872, regardless of what you're told, you're going to make on an 860 probably 5 horse, an 872 maybe 6 horse. If the motor is fully ported, on the big bores, then yes, you're going to pick up some more horsepower, it's a percentage. But if you do a big bore with your stock carb, you increase your airflow, this is a must for just about, for any big bore, have your carb bore. Again, we can go to 42.3 for the trail, it's plenty thick enough to last. And once you go bigger on your carburation, you're going to have a little less velocity, so you're going to go up with one main jet for boring the carb in millimeters. Now, let's get to practicality. We do a lot of dyno, an 18,000 dyno runs. With this carb here, it's a 56 millimeter crankshaft on my XP800 single piper. We made 203.6 horse. I went to the races and was scared. The thing didn't idle down as good as the stock carbs. It was a pain to jet, mainly because we're running in varying temperatures, maybe from 15, 20 degrees to 10 below at night as the night goes on, which requires a, a jet change. So I went back to the stock board carbs, dropped 
3.6 horse. I'm making 200 horse now. The sled is more responsive coming off the line and much more fun to ride. It does come back to idle all the time. So again, even though we see the big number on the dyno, you've got to come to practicality. If I was asphalt racing it in the summer, this would be the car. In the winter with the wide temperature variance, this is the car. Okay, now let me go to different car shapes, sizes, and etc. The interesting thing is if you look in a uh, V-Force read, or most reads, there's the shape. So you would think this oval or diod carb would be the way to go. Just logic or common sense, or a crankshaft has a big 59 oval. What we found in Dynoin, and I'm not an uh, airflow engineer, so I really can't explain it, this round carb going into a manifold which splays out or spreads out to this shape will make the same power as a diod when you're comparing sizes to size, size, same size. So don't get caught up in the hype. I know a lot of guys asphalt racing this year, the hype was to buy a diod. Well, guess what? They found out. They didn't go any faster. You won't go any faster. The beauty of the diod might be with the smaller tubes in the winter when you're getting that wide variance, your jetting may not vary as much. Um, so now if you look at the shapes, and again, if you look at the stock car, which the engineers do a very good job, there's your velocity tube or air guide. If you look at a crank shop, very similar. Now, here's some of the work we've done. Here's a 56 crank shop, which we actually tapered just a whisker, and then we brought this on to bring the air in a little better. We've also experimented around quite a bit with intakes. Here's one we tried on our Race XPs. Uh, longer, a lot of work. The stock actually worked just as good. So uh, we didn't gain anything. Then here's what we're using a lot on the big carbs. We're using a velocity stack which is smaller than the bell, which does give us a little bit of top end horsepower. It's a little bit harder to tune. Um, drops a lot around 8,000. We have to change ignition and jetting to get this to work. So here's a bigger one, same size as the carb, which on the small carb worked good. Really no gain on this carb. So now I do follow Formula One a lot, read a lot of air designs on their intake and stuff. So we bring out a wing design again to go with our big crank shop and did not work. Tried some varying ones. So for some reason this style ram tube seems to work the best on the bigger cars. Um, so again one last thing just to recoup on everything. Don't get caught up in a lot of hype. Think about the basics. Boring your carbs on an XP800 is going to give you two horsepower. Uh, which is a great game. You're going to hear people saying you're getting 10 with a pipe and 6 with a Y pipe. Uh, no, none of that's true. You'll gain 2 with a good Y pipe, 3 with a pipe, uh, 4.5 in the upper mid-range. So when you can gain 2 with the carbs, great gain. Same on your big bore. If you can take a 5 horse big bore and add another 2 uh, horse, that's a very good gain and you're not losing. And the same if you're a race guy. The correct carb and the correct jetting is, and again, we we bought them because we thought we could improve the correct size, the correct jetting for your application is the key. Um, hope this helps.